<laughs> if we could all just light up a fatty together right now and yes. have a communal smoke, absolutely. Why can't we all just accept, get over the stereotypes, realize that stereotypes limit us? Yeah. They limit our ability to think, to move, to explore, to create. Yes. Just get rid of them. Yep. Tokyo tonight. What's going on, man? <laughs> hey, hey, I, it, before this show started, I asked you guys if it was okay to swear. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen your opening. <laughs> so fucking A, I guess it's okay. There you right? go. Get into there it. You go. Well, he, what I'm seeing here are the three stages of beard growth. Yes. <laughs> you know, John, you I remember when I was a black bearded man mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and then I went through your face, you know, and now <laughs> there's a lot of gray in here. But, uh -huh. you know, it, it, it's all it just good. well, so we say to ourselves, <laughs> it, it's all just a vain, futile effort to try to look younger. Yeah. But you know and, what? Yeah. Though? People are going to trust you more than they trust me because you got you got the mix. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's the the gray gives me a little gravitas. Yes, exactly. Yes. Oh, yeah, even gravitas. when you said gravitas, I got chills. I was like, this guy did, knows did some you? Shit. Yeah, yeah. You, you'll you'll get it. You'll <laughs> get it. Unless you're cheating already. No, not yet. Not in the not. You're in not the beard, combing it in. I can see not, you combing it in. Oh, I did. I no, I've got the. Here's the thing. You know what? Matt Naples will love this if he's watching. I've definitely got gray like on the side. It's the camera work, but I've got the Reed Richards thing going on where it's coming in underneath. You have the simian thing going on. I've never <laughs> seen more hair on one head. My God. But we digress. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. In, the, in the world of men, you know, hair is an important thing. Now, you may be, yeah. you know, do you have hair up behind that cap? Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are I'm you man. hiding? All right. Okay, well, see, yeah. this is a big deal to us. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, six, I'm 65 in two months. Right. Wow, so you look just, great. You know, well... I comb through a little bit of what I call just for Gary. <laughs> it, it just takes a little bit of the gray sheen out of it. Just like for Gary. Where do they sell that? Most, uh, most Walmart for sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, yeah, there's there's some salt and pepper. My wife likes it, or so she says. That's what's in that's the that's thing that's important. Counts. Yeah. 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 I do you well, do you when you when you were when you were uh, uh uh you know when you had the long you had long hair I'm assuming at some point right I kind of looked like you I mean okay. I did I had long black hair and I, I had a black beard most of my Hollywood days I chose that as my look I I wanted to be Serpico basically <laughs> <laughs> you know and so I don't know if it was getting me jobs or losing me jobs but I thought that was my look that was, was what I was bearded man young man virile it's funny you know, that you say that marginally That's funny. Question. Yeah, do you does it does it did it get you jobs at Luigi Jobs? Did the ladies like it? Did they not like it? Well, like I said, my wife is in the other room. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, the ladies did like it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The ladies did like it, but I don't know if it worked in casting or not. You know, but yeah, whatever. Yeah. You, you 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 find what you look comfortable in, where you're happy. That gives you the confidence. I mean, I booked a lot of jobs, and I don't know that right. it was the whiskers, but <laughs> but the whiskers gave me a confidence that hey, this is how I want to be. Right, right, right. It's still how I navigate this planet. Like, Absolutely. okay, this is what I choose. Yeah. See, now that I feel like for comedy, this probably works. And then you've dabbled in the politics thing. Do you think if I went into politics, I'd have to get rid of all this? Funny that my wife and I were just talking about this. Because if I were Joe Biden's a counselor, I would say, put on glasses, Joe. <laughs> just put on the glasses so you're not squinting and looking lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. It, they were popular in the 19th century. But these days, and I learned this from running for office, mm -hmm. everybody around you who's handling you says, got to shave. People yeah. don't trust people with men with whiskers. Right. Glasses make you look old. It's all ridiculous. It totally is. But, but we fall into these traps and then yep. we're afraid to change them. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's totally and they think it has something to do with. But you know what? You know what used to drive me crazy? Like when I would work anywhere, and they would be like, "Oh, you know, you uh, we can't hire anybody with piercings. Why? Can they not hit buttons on a fucking register? Right. Like right. I don't care if they've got right. like five arms, one eye, and you know they're slightly touching me. If you can get me out of there faster than all the old other older people that are right. dressed well." Get me the fuck out. I don't want to. Right. And my tattoo is not going to talk smack yeah. to your customers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? I mean, exactly. Whatever you do. I, I don't know where this pathway leads, but <laughs> why, why do people care so much about the decisions we make about who we are? I mean, I we have... live in a world now and a social media world where we're, so many things are dictated. Right. Now, at the same time, so many things are like, hey, it's the Wild West. You're free yeah. to be who you are. But yeah. whatever that is, then there's a cottage industry that descends upon you yes. to say, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. It's yeah. got to be very confusing. I've got five kids. Yeah. Oh, and God. I can see the confusion that they have it, it, trying it is... to navigate. So yeah. I'll tell you when my friends and I were growing up, uh, there was no Facebook, right? We, we, we're like that weird generation where we're right. We still remember. I mean, I do anyway, cassette tapes, CD players, MP3 players moving into that kind of shit. I remember my first iPhone, uh, iPod, not even the phone yeah. yet. And then, you know, I think I had a cell phone when I started driving, but I fought it because my parents were like, we want to know where you are. And I was like, fuck that shit. You know what I mean? And then, but I had to have one anyway. So it was like weird. And then, but I remember like when Facebook came out, when we were in college, um, People were like, if you need to, if you want to get a job, like, like a little, like maybe right. like a junior year, they were like, you need to. So people were changing their names and they weren't allowed to show pictures of them with red solo cups because it meant you were drinking right. on the weekend. And I was like, what kind of fucking no, like if everybody just said, no, I'm not hiding that shit. I think we would have been better off. But immediately my generation was like, I want a job. And they would just start hiding it, deleting yeah. photos. And I'm like, could you imagine if they didn't employ people because they went to Woodstock? There'd be nobody <laughs> right. like, yeah. uh, you know, people were fucking in the mud and there was photos of it everywhere. And, you know, video footage, you know, who's going? It's, that it's my fundamental point that I mm -hmm. make with those who disagree with me. Yeah. yeah. And, and basically what I'm saying is, is I'm a progressive and there are a lot of people who aren't progressives, anti-progressives, right. right. conservatives, you may call them, who, who don't like my positions and, and they care about you know, gender messes them up and all sure. sexuality identification messes them up. And my question is, why do you care? Right. Yeah. Why do you care? Yeah. You make your choices. Let people make their own choices. Right. Let them make mistakes or whatever it is so that they learn to trust themselves and be themselves. Why do yeah. you care? What and, is threatening you so yeah. much? And this is why I know people are full of shit because now cut to the pandemic where the juxtaposition is my body, my choice for fucking mat, you know, for shit that's killing millions of people. You know what I mean? And it's just like, and that, that they have no problem distinguishing between a choice and lifestyle. Right. Everything else is heinous. Yeah. It's insane. Yes, but God forbid a woman should have a choice of dominion over her body if she right. gets pregnant, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, but these contradictions, they drive you crazy because right. they move the goalposts to yeah. fit their agenda. Right. Yeah. And so if you go after where they used to be, it doesn't matter. They're not there anymore. Right. It's right. like the love-hate relationship they have with Putin. Oh, yeah. I mean, once upon yeah. a time, you know, this is the Red Scare population. And then there's this love affair with this this uh, <laughs> authoritarian. Yeah. And now they're moving those goalposts again. Totally. Yeah. What I, I just read this recently and I may be like completely naive that I didn't even realize it beforehand. But I was, you know, between the Democrats and the Republicans, they um, Roe versus Wade could become a law. I may have this wrong, by the way. I'm not sure. I never. But Roe versus Wade could be locked down but the reason why they don't do it is the democrats always complain like oh it would get filibustered you know what i mean we can't actually make it into a, a real you know a thing that can never be changed because somebody would filibuster it but from what i had read somebody had basically analyzed the two points and been like it's all bullshit because the democrats needed to run on in order to win people and scare the shit out of people and right. voting that way and the republicans still need it because they need to run against it and that's the, that's why it's still an issue to this day is that do you find that well, to be yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Roe v. Wade came onto the the map. Yeah, uh, I'm old enough to remember ERA. I'm old enough to remember when Republicans and a predominantly conservative Supreme Court back in what 1972, right, ruled for Roe v. Wade. Right, and they granted a woman the rights to her own to her body. Mm -hmm. 
it was very popular left and right, but then it became a politicized issue as the silent majority took over. This became a foundational building block for a new conservative revolution right. to say, wait a second, this is anti-Christian. This is anti-Bible, God, et cetera, right. et cetera. And so that they embraced it. They did the same thing. And I'm on my soapbox now. I apologize. Yeah. No, great. They did the same thing with gun rights. Right. Once upon a time, everybody said, well, that's logical to have restrictions on deadly weapons. Yeah. But then they politicized that to be another one of their building blocks. And it became the Second Amendment thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's way past common sense. Yeah. But now it's so cemented. Now, I just assumed you guys are progressives. I, I didn't mean to go off on some. No, you know, you may not be. I mean, no, but I, it would be weird if I wasn't. <laughs> I suppose. So. But you know what? Let's say let's pretend that you are conservatives. Right. There's nothing wrong with this conversation that we're having. And there's nothing wrong with looking yeah. at the historical context of right. what we all were and what we've become and why. Right. Maybe if we unravel some of that stuff, we could start to go, you know what? There's some sense here yes. to having uh, restrictions or 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 um, uh, rules by which you show your, your proficiency with a firearm. Right. There's a reason to draw a line where an abortion is dangerously close to human life. But it's and where it is still in the dominion of a woman being able to make a choice because she didn't want to be pregnant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could talk about those things, but right. they become such politicized, passionate, foundational issues. Yeah. And the crazy we, thing is, too, is when they become politicized, no one ever talks about the fact that it's still a difficult choice, no matter which side of the bar of you wind up it on. Is. That never gets brought up because if it does, then you'd have to actually put in a human element to it and all the stress and anxiety and. You know, no one PTSD. is pro abortion, right? right. Pro choice. <laughs> yeah. Abortion's a horrible thing, right, right? It's horrible. I just like to go and watch them eat popcorn. <laughs> That's it. Super pro abortion. <laughs> you know what? That, you know what was great about that is it came after a, like a moment, like a beat where. Where what I really like about it is that we get to go back and go. Tom made a decision here. <laughs> Look, look, there, was it, a, there was a moment. It shouldn't be birth control, okay? It Agreed. shouldn't be an option like, well, right. I forgot to da 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 da. Sure, da. Sure, sure. Let's go get an abortion. Right. The yeah. whole now, now <laughs> the whole experience of sexuality mm -hmm. should require a certain amount of responsibility. Yeah. A this certain is true. amount of, uh, of yeah of of being an adult right, and, right, right. And, and understanding what you're doing here and the consequences yeah. of it. <laughs> Cut yeah. to literally, literally everybody I knew in high school right, right. thinking pulling out was a science, but yeah, <laughs> I, no, you're absolutely right. It's true. You know what I mean? It's still, it still amazes me that, but it's, you know, but that's part of like misinformation in general in the public there's misinformation. You know, uh, we don't get enough sex education when we're younger or in class because we have people opposing that kind of shit. And then we don't get it. You know, we don't get it in other areas too with, with it when there's like, you know what's crazy is when you see something in the news that you know has already been debunked and you know yeah. for a fact, like you're like, how the right. fuck? But they'll, but the funny thing is, is they won't just not talk about it anymore. They'll talk, they'll, they'll talk about the misinformation and say that part first and then later go, and by the way, but that was debunked. And then it's like, but now you've already got that out there. Whatever right. it is. No, look, you know, look, you, yeah. The Fox News turned that into an art form. The, right. The, the, the entire right wing uh, echo chamber turned that yeah. into an art form. If you repeat our, our ex president, if you repeat something three times, yes. it becomes truth to enough people. Right. And then you become the truthful journalist if you say, well, there are people who disagree. Right. With, right. No, there are people who debunked the entire theory. Right. Yeah. It a, it's an outright falsehood. Absolutely. But they will legitimize it by saying, well, now there's another side to this. Do you this see is... it? Uh, oh, yes. Just... No, no sorry, I have man. nothing to say. It's just, this... Oh, no, no, it's no. A, <laughs> it's a difficult world. It's it very difficult in this mass media, multi-channel world to navigate and, and look for the truth. But you have to be very um, vigilant. I feel like you vigilant. Have to... yeah. Exactly the word I was looking for. Yeah. You have to search for it and search hard. You have to look for informational sources that perhaps go against your ideological norm. Absolutely. Yes. Consider the other side as a possibility mm -hmm. 
and do the investigation to find out the actual criteria and facts that prove it one way or the other. One of my Absolutely. friends is a college professor, and they said they actually have courses now at this point, which is which made me feel slightly optimistic where they're, they're actually teaching people how to um, pick out misinformation. Identify misinformation. Yeah. yeah, and like what they need to do. And also now they're, they're talking about um, courses where they'll – be able to teach them how to communicate with people who may have fallen prey to it, which is, I feel like way, way more important too, because there's so many people who already believe it. They hardcore believe something and you're never going to shake their system. Yeah. There are fundamental ways, different ways in which people think. Yeah. You are a critical thinker. What you're talking about is critical thinking. Right. I like to think that I'm a critical think thinker. Mm -hmm. And that demands that you go deep, you go below the surface and you look for oppositional information. You look for an aggregate of ideas and thoughts, mm -hmm. but there are people who are simply binary and I'm not saying they're stupid. They're not, right. but they're binary thinkers. It's this or that it's black or white. It's up or down mm -hmm. and they cannot be convinced no matter what you say or what yeah. you show them. You know, I agree. Yeah. Do you think, uh, I feel like the advent of the internet like I think there's, there's no real way to say it without sounding like a dick. So here we go. Um, I feel like there's, I feel like I really do feel like those people sometimes they don't belong diving into every aspect. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there was a lot of people that this shit was forced on who were just kind of enjoying life, stumbling through it. Maybe, do, maybe weren't born to be critical thinkers and maybe didn't need to be presented. And now they with, have to be. They have to yeah. expectation. I swear to God though. I feel like there's nothing wrong with like, like I, there's certain shows that I love that are garbage TV that I use to decompress. And I understand that there's also people who watch that all the time and that's what they need to fucking do. Yeah. And then stop talking to me about, you know, if, stop feeling comfortable. First of all, like turning to me in a line and saying something completely racist just cause I'm white. You know what I mean? Like that's the kind of like blatant shit that's been going on. Like where I'm like, do you see me? Sorry. <laughs> but, like how am I? Yeah, no, it's mostly Tom. Uh, whenever Tom and I are out in public, if we're in line at a bank, he's like, can you believe the people ahead of us? I'm like, Tom, Jesus Christ, dude, fucking relax. Uh, <laughs> For whatever reason, and I don't know why, um, I've always been given, maybe it's from my parents, a, a, a regulator. Uh, because I've been in those situations where someone will say, can you believe the fucking... Yeah. put your epithet there. Yeah, yeah. And I've always been able to say, don't talk to me that way. Nice. Don't, don't assume that I agree with that because I absolutely think that what you just said and what you're thinking is, is anathema. It's, it's a, it's a horror show of, of goodness, of not yeah, goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've always been able to pull myself out of that desire to make them like me and to go, Oh yeah. Fuck you, you animal, you horrible. Yeah fascist piece of shit it's great to do it when they're in a store and they really are looking for something well, like kind a of starbucks like, yeah, yeah yeah something like that where they're looking for camaraderie for that two seconds yeah. and you're like you're not getting it here no you're not getting it here. <laughs> yeah yeah and now it's an awkward line <laughs> now right. it's like, have you ever been blown away by it where you're like i can't believe that you would assume that i was <laughs> oh, in that mindset a absolutely a look i live in i live in iowa and I'm in Chicago right now. With okay. my, my wife and I have a place in Chicago. We have a place in Iowa. But we have. I've been in Iowa for the last 18 years, right. and I love Iowa. Believe me, but it's a very conservative state, and I live in a conservative town. I'm surrounded by white people. I worked at an organization, and if there was a black person, it's like you know, you you, you noticed because yeah. everybody was white. So assumptions get made that you chose to be here because of its whiteness, right? And, and I, I'm not part of that family. Yeah. My, my, my wife are looking to, re, uh, and, are, and I are looking to retire somewhere else. And we look at the demographics. Yep. If there are too many white people, we don't want to live yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. <laughs> it is frightening. It happens every day. Somebody, one of our, happens and now every somebody day will almost. watch this and go, oh, you hate white people. No, I don't hate white people. No, yeah. I hate racist white people. I hate racist anybody. Right. I, yeah, I exactly. have a great story from the opposite end of that. When I was a kid, right, a large portion of my friends happened to live like in the projects, right? So one of my friends was having this party at his house in the project. So I go, right? Only white guy like walking into the, pro like in these uh, real projects. I knock on the door. Somebody comes to the door. I'm like, hi, is Jerry there? They're like, there's no Jerry here. Close the door. And I'm like, now I'm stuck. Now this is like beeper days. You don't have a phone. I got to find a payphone. So I'm walking down the thing. He comes and he opens the door. He's like, 
I'm so sorry, Tom. He's like, the only white people we see here are crackheads and cops, and they thought you were one of them. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I was like, that was an interesting one. <laughs> Well, you know, it, if we could all just light up a fatty together right now and yes. have a communal smoke, absolutely. Why can't we all just accept, get over the stereotypes, realize that stereotypes limit us? Yeah. They limit our ability to think, to move, to explore, to create. Yes. Just get rid of them. Yep. And it's amazing with all the information and, and, and that's out there that there would still be something that you're like, melanin makes you different. I don't understand how ever, like, like that's a crazy one to me because I'm like, there's so much science. Yeah, right. That's like, right. it's it's not that big of a deal. Why would my cognitive <laughs> ability be different based on my melatonin, right? Yeah, right. Melanin, crazy. right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's ridiculous. But yeah. we it's face it and we see it on Facebook. We see it on sites. We see it on, you know. Info yep, Twitter. Wars, but we see it in QAnon. Yep, yeah. Twitter, QAnon. I mean, that's the thing, though, too, is like QAnon's bringing people back from the dead now. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, well, not really, but, yeah. you know, they're saying they're coming back. It's one, it's one of those things that, like, I just, you have to either laugh at it, which I feel like we were at a certain point where we could, and now it's getting to the point where it's just too much, where you're like, where you feel like, yeah, you know, at one point, Joe Rogan could have talked about anything he fucking wanted to talk about, and it's fine because it's a podcast. And it's a comedy thing or whatever. And then it gets to the point where if enough people are actually believing nonsense, right. how do you regulate that? You know what I mean? Like, like up until I think it got to the COVID misinformation slash disinformation, we're not sure which one it, if it's willful or not, you know? Um, but like up until then point, I was like, ah, whatever. You know what I mean? If people are dumb enough to believe conspiracy theory shit or any of the stuff they're kind of talking about, that's fine. And then when it got to this stuff, I was like, nah, I draw the line there. Well, America elected a president based on that kind of thinking. So right. it, it is dangerous. I think we took our eye off the ball for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I think uh, somehow Americans became less interested in the process. They became less interested in politics. They le became less interested in representative democracy. Right. And by doing so, we kind of let them, we gave them a place at the table. Like, yeah. okay, all right, you, you can be here. They found out that they can win in numbers and in by being vocal. Mm -hmm. And now they have a strength. They're emboldened. Oh, I was in Dallas on a business trip when there was a QAnon um, convergence because JFK Jr. was going to make That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. These wow, people you... were serious. They weren't like, oh, maybe not. No, they said he's coming. Was that the one and... Robin Williams was supposed to come back at too? I don't know. I wish I was Robin, kidding, but I swear to God. I just it, remember. I And here's what. Look. Okay. You're crazy. You went to Dealey Plaza, but it clogged up the airport and it inconvenienced me <laughs> tremendously. Right. So their craziness really has an inconvenient factor. Yeah. It is. It is weird because you would think at some point, I think at some point we do get tired of, of all of this kind of shit, because I think even the left to a certain extent, you know, how many times can you walk out? or something you know what i mean like like nobody has like a real gauge you know what i mean of when and i don't want to say fight your battles but it is one of those situations where you're like oh what walkout is going on this week i guess we're walking out of netflix because of you know this and then you know there's a also don't eat jelly beans i remember one time it was like don't eat jelly belly and it was like why yeah, i'm not why? kidding i wish i was kidding and it, the why was because one of their ceos donated to an anti-lgbtq cause but the funny thing is, is it was like literally an individual dude that wasn't in charge of anything. Right. And then it's, it wasn't like Chick-fil-A level where it's the actual guy. Right. right? So you right. understand that shit. But then they're like, yeah, and fuck Jelly Belly. And people went, no, nah, I'm still going to eat Jelly Belly. <laughs> like it, like it, you were watching people make these I, decisions in real time, you know? I thought you were going to say it was because of the red one. I always think it's cherry and it turns out to be cinnamon and it's horrible. I know it is. <laughs> that is bad. I <laughs> will boycott it for that reason. Yeah, yeah. So would I. <laughs> Everybody wants to feel that they're involved. They want to think that they're important. They want to think that they can move the needle. They want to think that they're passionate. Yeah. I don't discount mm -hmm. anybody who might make the great Jelly Belly um, uh, protest. Right. Yeah. But I say, choose your battles for you. That's not what I'm going to take up. Right. You know? But do you um, think when the media picks up on it, that's when people get exhausted by it? You know what I mean? Like, it's fine. Yeah. If you, like, if one of my friends was like, hey, I'm not doing this, I'd be like, cool, good for you, whatever. But then I think when it becomes a trending thing because nobody else has anything they want to talk about that week, you know, news-wise, 
I think people look at it and they're like, oh, fuck, what do we what do I have to hate now is well, Reagan and for, did... forgive me for using this phrase, it. sure, this cliche, mm -hmm. but it's a slippery slope. I agree. It, 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 where do you draw the line? Because everything has a malfunction. Yeah. Everything and everybody. You know, you can't look at Winston Churchill and not realize that, okay, the guy was a sexist. Okay, he was a white elitist. Mm -hmm. But does that discount everything he did? Thomas Jefferson had a slave, obviously. Right. Does that mean he does, didn't believe in equal? I mean, everything has a relationship to a mistake. Yeah. It becomes our enlightenment that moves us beyond that. So whoever you want to boycott, Neil Young, go ahead, boycott Spotify. Boycott it. You mm -hmm. have that right. Joe Rogan has the right to right. voice what he says he believes. Right. What, what our responsibility to do as an aggregate public is to investigate that. Okay, Joe Rogan says that Invector, whatever the hell it is, works. Yeah, yeah. I need to look into that. Right. You know? I, think, I think that's very like the everything, though, right? I feel it like is. personal health. You should be doing the research on what's good for you, yes. not rely on your doctor. We have become a very <laughs> we have become a very <laughs> we have become a very lazy society. Yeah. We don't want to yeah. do the homework. We don't want to do the work. Government doesn't want to do the work. We need to roll up our sleeves, do the hard math, and do the investigation. I Ukraine agree. now is a perfect example because yeah. if you're on Facebook, everybody's a foreign policy expert. Everybody mm -hmm. seems to know the history of Crimea and Ukraine and the history of Russian nationalism. Right. Very yeah. few people actually do. And right. people are making decisions. And moreover, they're castigating decisions they don't agree with because it doesn't align with where they are. Yeah. Well, folks, mm -hmm. we got to do a lot more work here to unravel all of these issues. A lot more work. Right. But see, my thing is, too, is then I agree. Everybody should be responsible for what they look up, what they what they put into their body, whether what, what their health should be and all the other crap, too. But the problem is, is if the majority of the people in society don't want to do that anymore and then it starts to, you know, overflow into my way. You know what I mean? Like, that's the thing that bothers me, because that's when I feel like I'm not a government overreach. guy. I don't like that shit. But like in terms of covid, then I'm like, yeah, fuck it, because now. I don't know what everybody's so upset about. They won. We're not wearing masks anymore. Right. Uh, we never right. had a real right. lockdown. Right. And you know, the 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 the, the Second Amendment people are, are are saying they're taking away our guns. Nope, we've never taken yeah. a gun. Yeah. We've never taken it. You won. More school you shootings. Won, folks. Well, here's what I would ask everybody to do. If I could put a mental chip, whatever decision you make, mm -hmm. ask yourself, did I just politicize this? Ooh. Am I not wearing a mask because I think the progressives are saying to do this to control us because Biden wants more you know, authority? Did you politicize this? Because common sense should rule the day. Yeah. Well, always. I got my first vaccination at five years old, 1963. Mm -hmm. We stood in line and we cried at a needle the size of a Buick, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we got it and our parents said, you're going to get it. We did it. And guess yeah. what? Polio, smallpox, gone, right. eradicated. Right. Well, viruses have always passed around. The Chinese for years, you'd see them at airports wearing masks because there's a, a, a retrovirus that's going around. Right. Masks make sense. It captures the little particles. Are they perfect? No. Is it going to guarantee that you won't get coronavirus? No. Right. But it's a logical precaution. And simple. One of my and friends so literally. so simple. Yeah. This guy that I know, conservative, you know, Trump supporter, whatever, literally questioned. I haven't gotten it yet. Knock on wood. Right. And I mean, and that's, I, I probably will at some point. I have no fucking idea. Everybody's going to, you know, they keep saying everybody's going to wind up getting it. But he was just blown away. And he was like, oh, you know, but all you do is I don't stay inside. I do everything I need to fucking do. I mean, you know, for January, I canceled shows. But it's like very simple steps. Oh, it's high. We got another variant out. Guess I won't be doing dumb shit. Guess I won't be at the Applebee's bar talking about the you know, glory days, listening to Springsteen, you know, or whatever the fuck I'm doing in my denim jacket. Um, but you know what I mean? Like that kind of shit. Like, I just feel like it's pretty simple. It's simple requirements, well, simple requirements. If it's 98 degrees, do you wear a down jacket outside? No. no. Simple logic says this is not a good idea. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it, I may it, even cut the hair in that kind of weather. You don't know. <laughs> right. It gets really hot now in Jersey. <laughs> uh, but but this is where we are. I mean, yeah. and again, I keep going back to my wife, but my wife and I, keep, we talk about these things every day. It's, it's our salvation. 
It's how we calibrate ourselves and keep ourselves sane. As we talk about, is this going to fix? How do we resolve a nuclear, potentially nuclear crisis? Right. How do we get people to understand that we're not trying to control you with masks or vaccinations? We're trying to save your life and mine. Right. I, I don't know. We haven't come up with the answer to that yet, except yeah. I, we keep trying. And then we find ways to get silly. Yeah, we need an EMP. <laughs> we need him to knock out Twitter and the rest of that shit. And we need to fucking just be be cut off from each other for a little bit. And then that's it. These shows help. These shows and the Gary and Kenny show, we try to help. Your yeah. show helps. People can watch these. It's a dialogue. Yeah, we kind of pretty much agree. But that's mm. okay if yeah. people disagree. Right. If they want to write in and say, you're wrong. Fine, let's have the conversation. Right. It's important. Absolutely to be talking about this and not pretending that it's not happening. Yeah. That'd be, you know, that's the other thing too, is I feel like it's a very weird shift uh, of power or maybe balance. Even the fact that these show, like, you know, any show like that has that kind of weight. Isn't it weird that like, because our media has failed us so horrible, you know, horribly on such a large scale that now anybody that's got a, a talk show or voice also has to be held accountable for the dumb shit, even comedians, you know what I mean? Where they're like, like, isn't that a weird shift? Yeah. It, yeah, it is. It is well. Insane. When 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 the the big three were first corporatized, when Westinghouse and General Electric bought you know ABC Capital and NBC and etc. Cetera, yeah. etc. Cetera, it became a ratings numbers game. Yeah, it, it it started to change journalism. But then when the big old behemoth called Fox in 1998 came, which became agenda news, mm -hmm. news to literally fit what this section wants to hear right. and became so popular. The only way to compete is entertainment news is right. fabricated news, hyperbole news. And it's very yeah. hard. You find podcast. Look, I watch you now. Um, I Thank pay you. attention to, to Joe Rogan. I mean, if Me you're too. in the podcast business, you can't pretend like Joe Rogan doesn't exist. I actually like his show. I mean, when he's got a good guest on that, I really love. Yeah, I absolutely. Actually like, I like all the good. I like talking about all that kind of shit. I really love listening to it. I don't think it should go away. I, even even with the you know shit now, I never thought it should be taken off completely. But it's just like our responsibility is to look deeper to look for more resources. If you have a guru, if you have your personal information, Jesus, you're probably <laughs> making a mistake. Right, right. You're making a mistake. Yeah. PIJ, personal information, Jesus. I, information, I, if, Jesus. If you're not selling those as little bobbleheads, I don't know. I, I think you that's know, the name of the episode this time. I'm so thinking information, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> PI. All right. That's up to you guys. That's great. Take that it. is fucking great. Oh, God. Um, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Do you, do you still like, um, you know, dap follow comedy, like religiously and stuff like that? Do you understand like the stand up circuit and, and shit? What's going on there? Well, yeah. Yeah. But I more or less do it as an old middle-aged man in the Midwest. I have my <laughs> comics that I like. I do a podcast and we love having comics on my cohort. Kenny Seisler was a director. He directed Comic Strip Live, where mm -hmm. I was the host in 1990. And we had everybody from Seinfeld, great to show. Tim Allen, everybody was on yeah. the show. And Great. so he's firmly rooted in the in the stand up world. Um, I, and I still, you know, uh, in, until Louis C.K. was disgraced, he was my favorite comic. Right. Right. You know? and, and now he's quietly your favorite comic. Now he's quietly my favorite comic. But of course, there's Gaffigan and there's all sorts of. Yeah. People, Brian know? Regan. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. uh, and I love to watch them. I'm not a junkie for it because mm -hmm. I'm consumed with my life. And I know I keep talking about the fact that I'm. 65 years old almost, but I'm very proud of that fact Yeah, because my life is full of my wife, my children. I do a lot of community work. I work with underprivileged kids and I work in politics. I help candidates, yeah. with speech writing and things like that. So I'm so consumed with things that I think are making a difference. Mm -hmm. Face it, I'm looking at 30 years max and I'm gone, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he died yesterday. <laughs> And you are, you do start to look, once your beard starts to go gray, <laughs> you start to think about your legacy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You do just a bit. And so I think about what am I leaving? Did I make any difference? Right. Any no, difference between Putin, you know, blew up the world. Did, was it, did it matter that I was here? Did I, I'm not going to lie to you. We are blaming you for Putin. 
Uh, I've already, I've already got, I've already got the paperwork, John. Up, yeah. join the club. <laughs> he, he was my personal information, Jesus, and he really betrayed me. <laughs> um, but but I really do look at: am, am I a good role model for my kids? Does, yeah. does my wife and I inspire each other? Uh, do we create things that are people enjoy? So I'm more focused on, like what you guys are doing. Like my this, yeah. yeah, is more important than than maybe you know going to a comedy club. Now I said that and I want to retract it in the sense that I'm not this serious all the time. <laughs> you have to go out and get goofy. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. My wife and I love to go out and see a show or see a comedian or, or just get silly or, you know, yeah, or, play, of or play dress up where yeah. she puts on a black beard and I put on a little <laughs> maid's outfit and it's just lots of fun. We're having masks made of us, so if you guys want us to send those over, I, I do I'll send love. The hat. I do <laughs> love all this facial hair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. I know. I don't know what you mean. Anytime I talk to a comic who's starting like now, basically, I always because when I was when I was younger and I was starting, I wanted to have, um, you know, it's either a choice of moving into the city where you're consumed by comedy and consumed, yeah. and your only friends are comedians, right. or whether I wanted to stay in my apartment where I was and have a social life. And I'm so glad I did the two because I think it would fucking I think it would. I think I would have had less of an experience trying to not, you know, trying to consume just comedy consistently, yeah. which I like doing. But I also like my friends who don't do fucking anything like that and not in showbiz. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just nice to have people who are not con constantly consumed by. We should make a video. No, oh, I shouldn't. know. No, it it does get overwhelming when everything becomes a bit. And yes, every, and you're always a soundboard for somebody's thing. Right. Look, I didn't really choose comedy. I went to Northwestern here in Chicago. You know, mm -hmm. a thousand years ago. Um, before Lake Michigan was put in and, <laughs> and, and I wanted to be an actor. My goal right. was Broadway, but I fell in with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Brad Hall, Paul Barras, Rush Pierce, and these incredibly uh, funny people. Mm -hmm. And, and we just started doing sort of guerrilla theater, stream of consciousness theater, uh, consciousness theater, yeah. very politically uh, oriented. And at the same time, absurdly funny. We loved Monty Python. We loved the Beatles. Yeah, right. um, we love Saturday night live. So we found ourselves doing comedy, but that had a point. Right. That led to Saturday Night Live. Well, once Saturday Night Live happened, it's like, okay, all right, great. I'm on TV. I didn't even want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, seriously, I don't yeah, know I how you, yeah. to do it. I don't know yeah. how to navigate this. Right. Um, it's not any part of my dream to do right. that, but there I was. Yeah. Um, and you were so from 82 sort of to 85, right? As a comedian. Uh, 82 to 85, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my career sort of became, oh, you're a comedian. Well, mm. no, I'm a f marginally funny guy. <laughs> I, I'm a comic actor, but I'm also a very good actor. You want to see me have pancreatic cancer and cry for my, my <laughs> son who was killed in Vietnam? I'm, I'd be great. Right. Yes, please. I want to see that right now. <laughs> yeah. Can we can we dim the lights on us? <laughs> Just bring him in. Um, but... <laughs> But you fall into that and everybody wants you to be funny. Well, I also like delivering. You know, I like being yeah, yeah. funny. Yeah. I like conversations like this where everybody's funny and we're actually talking enjoying about something. It. Yeah. Yeah, enjoying yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Did you did you feel any like how was the pressure affected when you guys were, you know, doing your own thing, doing guerrilla comedy and then going into Saturday Night Live? Did you feel it or were you like because you had the attitude of I didn't even really want this, maybe it didn't Maybe well, didn't. once you get Saturday Night Live and you realize 12 million people are watching you and you realize it makes careers, suddenly it all becomes very important. Okay. Suddenly all of those <laughs> other dreams like, fuck that. I got to make this work. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, you know, in my defense, I was a sh I wasn't shy, but I was a kid from the Midwest and I didn't know how to navigate those waters. Sure. I didn't know how to create sound bites, catchphrases. Right. Um, cartoonish characters. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't know how to do it. So I was a fish out of water. I found my way and I made it there for three years. And I felt like I did some stuff in my third year and people I really admire, like Chris Guest and Billy Crystal really yeah. said, Hey, Kroger, you're good. So nice. that's, uh, that's cool. a feather in my cap. That's yeah. great. But it's, it, it, it becomes what you want to do, mm -hmm. but then eventually it catches up to you. What do you really want to do? So when I turned my back on show business 18 years ago, I tried it all. I never got to the level that I wanted or that was my goal. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a sitcom star. I wasn't a movie star. I never became Tom Hanks. Right. But I I knew that I did my best and I tried and I made a living for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, I'm going to be a dad. Maybe I'll get into politics. 
I want to be a community organizer. I want to have health insurance. Right, right. (laughs) I want to provide. What's that? Um. (laughs) Well, I I made that my goal. My life purpose of all my years as an actor slash comedian really just come to play where I am now, Mm -hmm. trying to be a good citizen. Yeah. Trying to have Mm -hmm. something to say to somebody that might go, thank you for that. That really helped me get through a bad day. Right. Yeah. Or that helped me put some pieces together that I couldn't figure out. Where did, what, what kind of cultivated the, the politic political side of you? Like that my, kind of my, my parents were, my dad was a John Deere engineer. My mother was a school teacher, but every night, every night at dinner, it was what was happening in the world. Nice. And Vietnam was the thing when I was a kid, mm-hmm. we went through Kennedy's assassination, Johnson, Nixon. Wow. And so politics, RFK assassinated, Martin Luther King assassinated, the Watts riots, all of these things happening in 1968. And my parents were just very, very active, progressive, critical thinking people. Right. And so it was just my matrix. It was just my DNA to um, to care. Right. They were civil yeah. civil rights minded. Um my, my mother was one of the very first teachers in America for Head Start. So it was all about what can we do with what we've been given to help people to help themselves who maybe yeah. didn't get the same advantages. So that's been my focus for most of my adult life. And then you were you like funny as I mean, everybody says, were you funny as a kid? But it's interesting that you I was started hysterical out- as a kid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I could exactly. imitate everybody. <laughs> I was hysterical. I loved Barney Fife. Welcome to The Rock. Here at The Rock, we have some rules. Rule number one, obey all rules. I loved Red Skelton. I loved The Beatles. I'm still a Beatle maniac. Wow. Um, I had the gene that simply wanted to entertain people. Okay. Make them think, make them laugh, make them look at the day a little bit differently. I've always wanted to do that. Yeah. You said you were living somebody else's dream. So when you were a little kid, what was your dream? Like what was the one that I think that, well, first of all, when I was a little kid, I was seven years old when the Beatles hit America. I thought being a Beatle was a career option and I'm not saying that to be funny. I really did. I thought when I get old enough, I'm going to be a Beatle. I'm going to choose that. It was perfect for me. Um, So in a way, what I wanted to do was entertain. I wanted to see people jump. I wanted to see them smile. I wanted to see them move. My real idol was Red Skelton. Wow. And me, God bless. You know, just this (laughs) lovable clown with pathos Mm -hmm. and understanding, a humanity. I loved Barney Fife Mm -hmm. because it was the same sort of a broken figure that was trying to make himself more than he was right. A proud, but small man. Mm -hmm. I loved Dick Van Dyke. Those were my heroes. The best. Yeah. That's what I wanted to be. Yeah. Dick, Dick Van Dyke show made me want to pretend to be a writer. And then (laughs) I I want to do that. Right. I was like, that looks like a lot of fucking fun. And Dick Van Dyke is 98. I know. And And he's he's still dancing. Did you see, I was going to say, did you see that video that he posted? Yes. I reposted it. I commented on you. I was going to say, where did I see that? You posted it. Yeah. You, you commented (laughs) for me. Yes. Yes. Oh, full circle. Yeah, exactly. I was like, I just saw it. I don't know where. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's amazing. He is. I mean, I, when I first, there's a weird story weird story and not even that much of a story when i got out to la i met this publicist took a liking to me and out of the blue she was like oh yeah we were at dick van dyke's and i was like i'm sorry back up what yeah you know what i mean i was like i'm like and then i was like oh i'm a huge you know dick van dyke fan baba and i'm trying to finagle she told me where he lived and then i was like you do know i'm going to go there right (laughs) <laughs> and you know, I like, will be in his bush tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, in more ways than one. But like, I was. <laughs> I was <laughs> we're gonna cut. You that. beat me to it. No, I knew it. Ne- <laughs> never cut funny. That's a rule of thumb. Never cut funny. I saw Tom raising for it. I was like, Fuck it. Um, but but that was the thing. I actually he wasn't. He was actually. It was kind of weird because I was like, oh, he's not going to be anywhere, forgetting that he, even though he's ninety, he's still active. I drove to, you know, where you, I don't want to say where it is, but I drove to where it was. I went to the area because she was basically like, he's so nice. And uh-huh. he, he goes to that local, gro- like he goes to the grocery uh-huh. store. Like, that's what he does. Like, he'll talk to you. And I was like, fantastic. Yeah. So I went, because I know the story about him reaching out to, um, you know, Laurel and Har- uh, Stan Laurel. 
Yeah, Stan Laurel. And I was like, oh, it's kind of the same thing. Not really. Uh, he said to Stan Laurel, he said, you know, I stole your act. And Stan said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that. That's yeah. hilarious. That's fantastic. But anyway, I didn't get to meet him. He was literally in Disney, like promoting whatever the hell was going on. And I was oh. like, I like that's that's, you know. That's on me for thinking a 90 year old man's going to be at home. Well, he, <laughs> he, he, he is a nice man. And I had the pleasure to meet him twice as an oh, older wow. man and yeah. as a younger man, when he was in Iowa making a film called cold Turkey, he was a very kind and approachable. Love. My first, my first great autograph, film. but oh, he wow. went through a dark period. And I think there's something to, to important here. He was an alcoholic mm -hmm. and through the Dick Van Dyke show, America's funny dad was yeah. an alcoholic. And there was the story that these brilliant scripts would be brought to him and he'd go, Ah, uh, who wrote this piece of shit? Carl? Wow. Uh, I'll make it work. So that's sort of what wow. I do whenever I do a show. <laughs> I go, uh, I'll make it work. <laughs> it's an homage to Dick Van Dyke when he was angry. Right. And, and unhappy. Yeah. But he came through it. Right. He saw the light. He, he, he. Got rid of those demons, if you will, and and uh, and emerged as the person that he really is, the yeah. ultimate entertainer. And they kind of did a movie a little bit about that touched on it, too. Him and Carl did, right? The first drama that he did? Yeah, yeah. It was called, I think it was called The Comic or something. The like Comic. That. I believe yeah. it was called The Comic, yeah. Yeah. There was that, and I gotta add, there's another movie that I love. I was talking about it with Bobby Slayton when he was on, because he had never Bobby. seen it. He's so great. Um, he ripped me for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> like and that was just it. And I was just like more. Um, but no, he was great. Um, but it's called The Art of Love. Have you ever seen it? No. I'm telling you right. This I love telling I people like about the Dick Van Dyke movie. It's a great the art of fucking love. movie. The art of love. He plays um an artist who's not successful, not doing well, and his buddy convinces him to uh fake his death so that his paintings go up in price i feel like i should know and this he, oh it's so good and he has I to think hide I, out. this would be a remake this is a great idea let's do it let's cut the show and we'll start writing <laughs> now. Wait, you, wait, you write the script and i'll look at it yeah i'll make it work <laughs> you just described most of my career so that's fine. <laughs> i think it's good um that's that's phenomenal so take me from i gotta because i want to know like what the hell the path was between you left snl and then went into politics right away, or did you do something in between? No, no. Um, <laughs> I didn't leave SNL. SNL left everybody. Oh, that's in, right. In 1985, SNL was over. Right. Dick Ebersol yeah. left. Marty Short only wanted to do it a year. Chris Guest, uh, Billy Crystal only wanted to do it a year. Right. And so once they were all gone, they weren't going to continue Senate Live with me and, and, <laughs> and Julia and Mary Gross. I mean, I'm not dissing any of us, yeah, yeah, but yeah. we were at the marquee. Right. So the show was over, and Dick Ebersol was going to replace it, I think, with Saturday night's main event. It was going to be a wrestling show. Wow. Lauren, who missed his show, he had the break that he wanted, uh, was lured back. And so in 1986, when he revamped the show with uh, Anthony Michael Hall, Robert Downey Jr., uh, you know, a pretty weird, yeah. diverse cast. Yeah. Um, he wasn't going to have anybody from Dick Ebersol's era. So right. it was over for me. Okay. So I literally loaded up the truck and moved to Beverly. Um, <laughs> I, I got in my Mazda RX-7 and drove across country and had my same agent from New York in, you know, at ICM. And mm -hmm. so I started a career there you know, for 20 years. I, I had a, a journeyman's career. Okay. Pilots, short-lived series, B-movies. I started doing game shows, all of which I loved doing, mm -hmm. loved it. It was all entertainment, hosting shows, comic strip live and stuff like that. But like we said earlier, you know, it, it ran its course once I became a father. Mm -hmm. and, and I looked at my son and, and I thought, I don't want to say you'll get braces when daddy's show gets picked up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I say that as a joke, but it's really kind of serious. Right. Yeah. So in... 19, I don't know, 2003 or so, I decided, you know what? I want to find a real job. And I moved back to my hometown where they, still to this day, they buy me drinks and bars because that's the guy that was on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a little gravitas again, mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. you will, um, in, in Cedar Falls, Iowa, Waterloo, Iowa. And I've been there for the last 18 years. Nice. I've remarried and my, my wife has three of her own children. So we're a blended family of oh, five. Nice. And um, that's a full-time uh, gig. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, but you asked about politics. Well, once I got back 
to Cedar Falls. See, Iowa, you can, I had some, a, a little bit of notoriety here. Right. And I immediately got a column in the local newspaper and I write the left side of the column. So I had a very perspective point of view. Iowa has a history of being, we went for Obama twice, but then right. they went for Trump twice. It, it can be a little purple, but sometimes can go blue. There's there's opportunities, even for an old progressive like me, to try to get into the state house and make a difference. And so I thought I could. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I was a very good candidate. Uh, people made things like what's behind me here, Gary Kroger, Hope, oh, which, I love which, that. which I love. So it. awesome. Um, but I was I was very good on the stump. I was very good with extemporaneous speaking. My ideas were solid. They were progressive. But the Trump wave took even the blue dog Democrats. Wow. And I lost by a sizable amount. Mm -hmm. I don't regret it. I don't cry over it. Um, would I do it again? Probably not because it took so much money. All you're doing outside of going to central committee meetings is going, hey, John, <laughs> great. You look fan. You know, you got 500 bucks that you might uh, throw my way. <laughs> Eight hours a day you're doing right. It. That's not public service. That's not listening. Right. It's yeah. just raising money. But that's where we are. Without campaign finance reform, that's really the crux of what's destroying, I think, representative democracy. It's not re it's representative of money. Yeah. Absolutely. If all, you got, if I, if all the politicians are doing is spending time running and allocating money, then they're not that's actually right. governing. And once you win, what do you want to do? Win again. Payback. You yeah. can't get anything done if you don't win again. So what happens? Right. Interest groups. Hey, Gary, uh, I would love to influence you this way here, and we'll put <laughs> $25,000 into your kitty here from our pack. Right. But we kind of expect you. That's not governing either. Right. That's just interest, special interests. Yeah. So it's... It, <laughs> I don't want to be, I don't know how much time we have. I don't want to be on a sour note, but it, no, there's, no. A sick, there's a sickness in, in our democracy. Yep. It, it is crippled. It isn't really a representative democracy anymore. We really are a plutocracy. Yep. Yeah. You know, and with memories and history books that we like to read of, of when we were trying to be a democracy. Right. I hold out hope that it's why I ran. I thought, well, if some people like me who are truly committed and truly open-minded can get involved, maybe we can change this thing. I still am hopeful, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's going to be me. I, I mean, that's... Uh, you got 30 more years in you. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, well, apparently, <laughs> I intend to be the Dick Van Dyke of, of, <laughs> of podcasts. Fantastic. <laughs> do, you, do you still feel connected to that world in any way, though? Like, are you still... Politics? Yeah. Well, very much, because anybody who runs for office, whether it's locally or on the state house, they, they want my opinion nice. or, or they want me to help them with their materials or things like that. I do a lot of, especially in the pandemic era mm -hmm. of, of hosting podcasts and Zoom casts and and having debates with candidates. Nice. Um, so I stay very involved. I still write a column for the paper. You know, the Waterloo Courier, if you ever mm -hmm. want to look for Gary Kroger, Absolutely. Waterloo Courier. Um, I've got hundreds of columns that I've been writing that I'm very proud of. Nice. I have a blog called Gary Has Issues, which is a political <laughs> good name, right? So well, great. it was actually the first title of our podcast and it was going to be political. And then we oh. went, you know what? We're politicked out. Let's let's I get into you. entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. That's what so we like. The the Gary show. Yeah. That's what we like. The dystopia theme, because we can go and dabble into it and come out of it and yeah. just fucking, you know, do whatever we want. Um, but yeah, did you get burnt? I mean, is it something that burnt out faster in you than maybe, do you think like, like you said, like you're a little out of, you know, politicking, you don't want to talk about it too much on your podcast or whatever. Cause you know, it's enough, but at the same time, like, would you say the comedy went first or the politic, you know what I mean? Like, do you have the same feeling towards both? Do you look at them with any kind of fondness, you know, like what's the. Well, that's a good question because, and, and and sometimes I just make my answers up on the fly and, and this will be one of those. No, because it is a good question because in truth, the comedy never leaves you. The, the desire to entertain never leaves you. Right. The desire to be involved with politics and try to move the needle to try to be socially conscious never leaves you. I don't yeah. think you ever get tired of it, but I think that there are, 
there's a shelf life after after a while you get tired of m&ms and you eat peanut butter cups and then eventually you come back to m&ms <laughs> yeah, yeah. absolutely stupid analogy <laughs> i realize that but now but, i want m&ms and peanut butter cups so. of course Together. you win gary you but, win <laughs> you know the, the, those you spin those plates and and you keep them alive and people also remind you you know my son said to me the other day my 17 year old son said dad why don't you run for office again you'd kill it right you'd be so good now, I'm not thinking about it, mm -hmm. but the fact that my son <laughs> said that to me goes, wow, I, I, I moved you as a young man and you listen to your dad now to realize that he is trying Good to make point. a difference. So that yep. that enlivens yeah. my interest without a doubt. Yeah, I love that. Are they um, would you be supportive if they wanted to go into the arts or not? Or would you be like, I, I, I'm going to say it again. I was just talking about this with my wife. <laughs> we don't we don't necessarily support everything, mm -hmm. but we discourage nothing. Oh, nice. If my kid wants to be a, a, a rock and roll artist, mm -hmm. um, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, God, what on earth? Maybe I'll just put some <laughs> magazines about engineering in front of him. But I'm never going to discourage anything, right. whatever yeah. they want to do. It's that's their not, choice. That's awesome. It's their journey. It's it's, yeah. it's their their path to get to where I feel like I am. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Were your well, parents I got thirty more years? Were, were your parents supportive <laughs> when you went into comedy? And they were the same way. It's like nice. they, they would have rather I was a doctor. My mother used to say, "You know, lawyers act, honey. They have to act <laughs> in that courtroom." She really wanted me to be stable. That's all. That's a great <laughs> argument. That's a really good like <laughs> no, twist. Like but that's you know. exactly what I. You know. That made sense to me. I get it, mom. I get it. And I love you. But yeah. I went this way and they were the first to watch me. They were the first to tell their friends. Oh. We, back in those days, they had a rotor antenna that they had so they could get SNL. You oh. hit the, <laughs> the rotor would move so they could pick up NBC. Oh my and, God. and they were very proud of it. It wasn't their milieu, you yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> an engineer and a school teacher, but you know, That's it was awesome. supportive. Um, well, listen, I want to thank you for coming on. I got to come up on the big three questions that we ask every guest. Do we have any other uh, stuff? we want? If anybody, to if anybody in the, in the crowd has some questions, feel free to ask them. And we'll be sure to get to them. Yeah. I didn't want to uh, pull them during. No, I hear you. Um, so here's the big three. We ask every guest that's come on. If you can go back in time and talk to your younger self, uh, what would the advice, uh, do you, do, what would, what advice would you give yourself today? Well, that's a huge question, and I've got like three seconds to come up with a. No, 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 no. we got plenty. Of, no, no, no. You go. This is just the. This is just the. Yeah, you go. Yeah. You know, some of those these answers are they're, they're going to sound like cliches, but cliches become cliches for a reason. Sometimes mm. I would tell my younger st mm. self, "Stop worrying. Stop. You're going to be fine. You're going to survive. The sun's going to come up." You can fail and your friends will still be there if they're your friends. Mm -hmm. Your family is your family. No matter what happens, no matter how many times you trip, get up and you'll find out that there's a good reason to get dressed today. <laughs> yeah. Because if, as a child, you do go through periods of, of tremendous doubt and depression. Yeah. Sometimes it overwhelms you and it gets the best of kids. Absolutely. And I would and I went through that on a couple of occasions. And I wish I could say, you know what? It doesn't matter what he said or she said. It didn't matter that that review said you're the worst actor that ever lived. <laughs> and I had one of those once. <laughs> the sun still comes up. It Absolutely. still comes up. I love that, man. I think that's um, really good advice. My mother, when we, I, it took me until I was like 30 something years old, but I was having a discussion with my mother and it, we had that same conversation. And I'm like, everything will be all right. It all works out. Yeah, and she's yeah. like, you know what? No matter how bad it ever was in life, like no matter where they were, they were always like, yeah, if we never thought it would, but it always did. Yeah. So why look at it like it's not going to? It's yeah. why this song resonates. Let it be, let it be. Yes. That's what that song's about. Absolutely. That's, that's what his mother would say to Paul McCartney when he got stressed. Yeah. When I find myself in times of trouble. I mean, that's what yeah. it's about. So good. Absolutely. And it's so true. We actually do have one from Scott Curtis. He says, were you on Harry Shearer's good side or bad side? I, oh, oh, this is somebody who knows some shit. <laughs> you know that Harry had a good side and a bad side. Yeah. I was on Harry's good side. Oh, nice. I was on Harry. Now, I wasn't a threat to Harry. He he put me in things. He made me a Chippendale once. And he was <laughs> he, he was the fashion designer. And I sat there literally with a bow tie and basically naked in a sketch. And, and he liked to use me as a prop. 
but one he had a bass because he played the bass guitar very very well and he had a yeah. stand-up bass and i'm invited into his office to talk about an idea and i picked up his bass and i just fumbled with it and i said damn it i always thought i would be an absolute natural and just be able to play this thing <laughs> he found that to be so entertaining for some reason that he decided <laughs> that he liked me yeah. <laughs> now I don't know who this, I hope it's not Sh Harry that is asking this question. <laughs> that would be better. <laughs> Harry had the worst body odor of any human being wow. I've ever encountered, with the possible exception of Robin Williams. But that's <laughs> no smelly men. Right. I would go into Harry's office if he wanted to talk about the Chippendales thing. And I did some other things with him. Mm. I, I really like, I think he's a genius. Yeah. But I would go, oh, that's an interesting idea. Oh, and then I'd get God. air through my sleeve. Yeah. You sort yeah. of filter it. Yeah. I met a few people like that before, too. And you want to be like, do you know? <laughs> like, and yeah. you just not care. Like, I want to know. I'm like, maybe they don't care. If they don't care, at least I'm prepared. But if they don't Well, know, if I smell, I want people to to tell me that yeah. you smell. I don't want to be. I don't want to be the person that leaves the room. and be, Or if I see someone listening to me pitch an idea and they're breathing through their sleeve. I go, oh, my God, I'm one of those. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm a I Robin know. and a Harry. Oh, my God. That's fucking <laughs> yeah. brutal. Yeah, but I, I was on Harry's good side. And I really admired him. A, a, a cranky guy. Mm. he's so intelligent and he does not suffer fools gladly. And so um, it was amazing. I saw him go after Billy Crystal in the press and I thought that was a bold choice, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I guess they didn't get along or he was like, I don't know. Well, didn't like I, the guy, but I didn't know anything about it. I don't know. I, I stayed out of his line of fire, you nice. know, and, yeah. you know, and from being downwind, <laughs> and yeah, so. so there was a very limited vantage point you could stand. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Fucking brutal. Um, <laughs> the second question is: What had to end in your life, good or bad, for you to wind up where you are today? What? What? Say the first part of that again. Yeah. What had to end in your life, good or bad, for you to wind up where you are today? My my divorce. Ah. <laughs> Yeah. Look, uh, I had I was married before. I had two children. My it's a blessing. It's mm -hmm. a blessing. I will always be grateful for that. But with my wife today, I'm in a situation where uh, I'm I'm free. I mean, yeah. I, and I, I probably should have come up with a million other things. God knows she could be watching. Uh, <laughs> not a bad person. We just didn't work out, right? Right. But when you're yeah. in a relationship that doesn't work out, what happens? You become more and more trapped. Both of you put more and more um, restrictions on each other to try to make it work. Yeah. And eventually you're both just suffocating. Absolutely. Well, when that marriage ended, of course, it was heartbreaking and horrible. And, and we had children and I was single for a long time. But then I met my wife. And if she hadn't been the kind of person that she is where everything's okay. I mean, I'm not coming home with prostitutes and heroin. <laughs> you leave them out the there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But everything I say, my brain is free. My thoughts, my dreams. We opened a restaurant. That's always a stupid idea. Oh. I bought a sports car. That's <laughs> always a stupid idea. But she's kind of, okay, honey, we'll make it work. The sun right. comes up tomorrow. Yeah. So I found my son comes up tomorrow person. That's beautiful. Because and that's so, exactly what you want. Yeah. So it, it does take sometimes the tragedy of a failed marriage or something like that to find yourself open and ready for what you really need. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, man. Anytime a friend's relationship ends, I'm always like, you're literally one step closer to finding out who you actually want to be with. And who you are. And who you, you are, really yeah. want. Yeah. Because exactly. you do forget in most relationships, they become, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Stop doing that. So it just goes that way. Yeah. And you start to forget what you want. You start to think, I do this because I want to. No, you do that because they want you to. Right. Yeah. Right. Now we're in this mutual compatibility thing. It's like, you know. Yeah. I'm not wearing pants right now. And she's cool with it. <laughs> I'm cool with it too. Fact, I don't know right if you're here. Hi, <laughs> now she's going to be banging on the wall. I know, I know, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. That's so great. Now um, we know why you're so happy in the relationship. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Oh dear. So good. Um, and then, so last question is my favorite question. Cause it ties in with the show. If this was a genuine dystopia, Alien zombies, meteor heading to Earth, uh, climate change hits the worst. What would be your epic death? How would you want to go out? 
<laughs> wow, that's a good one. And and you know, it's funny that this show is dystopia tonight, and Ukraine has been invaded, and yeah. nuclear weapons are as close to certain people as I am to this coffee cup. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I, I would want to go out. Uh, it, we're, let's imagine it's Holocaust. It's we're we're being vaporized. The 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 the, the, the wind of nuclear holocaust is is sweeping our way and we have seconds mm -hmm. i want my family around me because i can't have all my friends because they have their family mm -hmm. and i want to say i love you guys and i'm sorry we screwed the pooch <laughs> but know that the time that you've had on earth 17 years 20 years 30 years mm -hmm. 65 years all of this time was a vin uh, was a window that you didn't have to be given. That was a miracle that we're here. The fact that we get to spend this moment right now, and then we would go out singing Kumbaya with a big bear hug. Nice. And I'd have an excellent bottle of wine. Oh. <laughs> I like really the image of you wine. hugging your family, but with a bottle of wine with, in hand. Yeah. I'm <laughs> drink, having it intravenously, and I'm teaching. Kids, kids, let's, let's get into drugs Everybody right get into now. the hug. We've got 35 seconds. Here's some heroin. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Louis C.K. How do you tell your kids drugs aren't the answer when they actually are the answer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a great bit. Oh. We have 35 seconds. Here's some heroin. Might be the runner-up for the name of this episode. I know. It's a real coin toss. Well, you've had a few. You yeah. Know, put, them all, put them all out there in your promotional materials. See so you. fucking good, man. Thank you so, so much for coming on, man. you got to come back and join us again. Uh, you guys, anytime you ask, I've had as much fun as... I've had as much fun without my wife as I could possibly have. <laughs> Wait till we do it live. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's going to be great. You'll see what you come home with then. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of fun. Thanks, Thanks so much for inviting man. me. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Man. Have a good night. Dystopia tonight.